to another sociological theory lecture in the wake of coronavirus. Um, this lecture is a skeleton key to Michel Foucault's Madness and Civilization. Um, this is really his first book that was widely available in English, um, translated and, and published here in 1965, translated by Richard Howard, um, and, and I, I think very um, elegantly translated. Um, it's a history of insanity in the age of reason, right? So uh, the vintage press uh, paperback that I use in classes uh, is available uh, widely. And I think, again, the pagination, I think, is the same for any English language version of this text that you can get, including those that are online at like archive.org and other places. OK, so a very early text of Foucault's. Um, and you'll find that many of the ideas associated with Foucault, or many of the sort of the elements of the Foucault brand are visible here. Good writing, almost poetic in passages, um, a lot of rich historical illustrative material, um, a kind of um, archivist um, focus on detail, coupled with a, um, a really sweeping uh, um, generalist capacity to, um, to order material into large conceptual uh, schemas. Um, the, the content of the book, focused as it is upon institutions of discipline, social control, uh, punishment, um, power knowledge, uh, uh, you know, disc scientific discourses, popular discourses, the relationship between institutions of social control and sort of moral panics that spread throughout populations and that lead to the stigmatization of marginalized uh, um, uh, groups. Um, you know, I think all of these themes are present here. And I think you can actually see a lot of his later work sort of prefigured. I think there's absolute um, uh, correspondence between this book and Discipline and Punish, between this book and Birth of the, uh, uh, of, of the Clinic, um, and between this birth, uh, book and, and the history of sexuality. So if you've seen some of my other lectures or if you've read some of Foucault's other work, uh, you're going to feel familiar as you're working your way uh, through this book. So in, uh, one of the things I like about, about uh, Madison civilization is that uh, non-specialists, people who aren't interested in reading uh, the archaeology of knowledge or the um, order of things, would, are, are going to find here um, a kind of um, relatively coherent and almost um, implicit uh, and comprehensible uh, um, archaeology or genealogy. I, I think it's archaeology, really, um, in the way that he goes about doing his research. So he does his work in archives primarily, and then he does a lot of imaginative things, too. He winds up in, a, you know, I think in art museums and, um, you know, reads uh, poetry and reads literature and so, and so on. Um, history of scientific literature, he finds himself there. But, but he's not really doing history, he's not really doing sociology, despite the fact that he's using sociological concepts and theories at times, and that he definitely is at play in the field of historians. But what he's doing is something, is something that, that I think he would call archaeology. So this is not for professionals, but I think to give you kind of a back pocket comprehension of what it is that Foucault is up to when people say that, he, that he's engaged in archaeology or genealogy, um, I think it, you can see it here. So the book is written, um, you know, really begins back in, in you know, um, late antiquity or really the, the very, very... Um, uh, you know, middle part of the Middle Ages with leprosy and with um, th the Lazar houses that were constructed to exclude and isolate, um, um, you know, the infection of, um, of leprosy in Europe. So he begins, you know, about 800 or 900 years ago. And then he ends in the, uh, in the, in, in basically 1960s France. But I actually think that, it, that, that if you want to understand the logic of work that he did, you have to read it the other way around. So I want you to sort of think that, 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 that what he did, you, you know, he begins with modern asylums. These are places of ritual exclusion and confinement, you know, mental institutions, um, you, know, um, you know, asylums for the insane, for the mentally ill, um, that were very widespread uh, in his time, right? and that were dedicated to the treatment of mental illness. So, so this is a kind of conjoint 
exploration in the archaeological um, underpinnings of the contemporary asylum for the mentally ill. And in order to, to sort of understand, so, so sort of imagine yourself as stumbling upon a, an institution like, like, a, like a very old mental hospital in Paris, and then discovering that like if you go into the basement, there's going to be records there that date back, uh, you know, to the 16th century dealing with, uh, you know, confined poor people and confined uh, uh, criminals and other things that this place has been confining a whole lot of people for a long time. And then imagine if you dig underneath the basement into the foundations of that building, you uncovered um, um, records uh, that the building had actually been originally used as a lazar house, as a, as a place to exclude and, and, and confine um, lepers, you know, 800 years ago. So if you begin at the present and then you begin to dig down, right, and sort of uncover um, sort of material traces, uh, traces of, 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 of record, um, you know, bureaucratic leavings, um, um, you know, discourse, you know, uh, and so on, uh, images, um, news accounts, uh, biographies, um, and so on. You, if, if you keep digging deep enough, right, you're going to find the origin of these institutions. So, so again, it begins with the modern asylum, the confinement place for mentally ill people. He, he tries to, again, archaeologically dig down to the foundations of confinement of marginalized, stigmatized identities within uh, Europe, lepers, um, in, say, the 12th century. And then he has a different project. That's the confinement part of it. But then there's the madness part of it, the mental Ill illness part of it. And so, again, he sort of traces back in time major turning points or or major uh, uh, moments of intersection um, between confinement and mental illness. And it, it's really interesting, you know, again, he talks about contemporary psychoanalysis, sort of the talking cure, um, and, then, and then, he keep, then he walks back from that, you know, the working cure, cure um, and then some of the other sort of body embodied cures that, that we're engaged in. And, and but, but even before um, mentally ill people mad people, people who'd lost their reason, were confined, you know, they wandered about out in society. And so then he talks about the, the cultural location, the symbolic meaning of, of, of fools, of madcaps, right, of those engaged in folly. And, uh, and then he uncovers the, uh, or talks about the sort of rena Renaissance era ship of fools from right around 1500, the beginning of the 16th century. So just as capitalism has really begun to get a foothold, you know, right prior to the uh, to the Enlightenment, you get a sort of cultural clarification of of what it is to be a fool, right? A folly of 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 unreason, right? As he's going to talk about, and so then he then he traces that back. It goes back even further, and you wind up in the medieval world, where um, where foolishness and folly and uh, being mad and so on are actually built in uh, to everyday life and really aren't um, segregated from it, although we're going to talk about that a little bit. So you wind up in the, uh, in the Middle Ages in what he calls it, you know, the Gothic era, where you have leper houses that do not house people with mental illness, and you have people who are probably mentally ill or at least exhibiting symptoms of madness who are thought of as people engaged in folly or fools or something like that, and who really aren't segregated off. And when they are dealt with in a kind of systematic or institutionalized way, they're placed upon, he claims, ships. Really, it's, it's a metaphor. Uh, there really aren't ships of fools that carry these people away. But, but, um, but, 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 but there are ex mechanisms of exclusion. Um, and that, again, that, that, that mentally ill people then are caught up in a great confinement, he's going to talk about, of the, of the unemployed and the, and the poor. And, uh, and then, again, like there's going to be a history then of the treatment of madness that's going to emerge from that, at least a meaning of madness. Okay, so, so he's not writing a history of these institutions. He's, or he's writing an archaeology where he is, again, digging down to the foundations of 
of, of institutions of confinement, of stigma, stigmatized, marginalized, potentially contaminating populations, and at the same time, a, his, um, he's digging down to the foundations of mental illness, madness, really, as a cultural concept, um, and then trying to see how this fits into uh, the symbolic order of the modern world, okay? So it's archaeology, digging down to the foundations and, you know, keeping track of, of the kind of symbolic forms and, and imaginary forms that are associated with a given time period in a given location. Okay. All right, so we've kind of prefigured the book a little bit. So, so um, the book is written in the reverse order of what I just showed you. So he's going to begin um, by writing about lepers. And then he's going to write about uh, sort of the Gothic or medieval period. So I've tried to create a kind of a one-page summary of the book here. And um, so, and, and I tried to keep the, these two sort of processes separated out. So we'll do at the top first. So if you go all the way back to the, to, to the Middle Ages, it, it really is lepers who are contained within Lazar houses who are ritually excluded, not mad people. Mad people are actually, again, intermixed in the everyday population, right? So you have the non-mad and the mad intermixed with each other. And I really think a better way to think of that is he hints at it. He doesn't really quite get there. You know, Durkheim's writings about the, the dual phasing of traditional life, where you have moments of, of, of sacred coming together into festival or, or feast or ritual, uh, and, then, and then punctuated by periods of, of dispersed, individuated, you know, first life activity of, 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 of economic action and family raising and those kind of things, followed again by, uh, by ritual. Well, that's what I try to uh, depict here. So Durkheim has this dual phase uh, um, logic of traditional medieval life. So does, so does Mikhail Bakhtin. You know, his theory of, of, of the carnival, of carnival, or the carnivalesque, like in the poetics of, uh, you know, uh, Dostoevsky's poetics, right, um, is where, um, you know, he writes about the first and the second life, um, and where, where, you, where you have a population of people with maybe mentally ill people and, and non-mentally ill people interspersed among them, who rotate back and forth between um, sort of serious first life and then uh, unserious first life that, that travesties it. So um, it's a book I did with, with my friend Bill Swart, NASCAR Sturgis and the New Economy of Spectacle. We've got a, a, a section on Bakhtin and the carnivalesque. And in, in, um, you know, in Bakhtin, the medieval carnival is, is, um, is a travesty or a flipping over. It's a second life that travesties or flips over or inverts the first life of serious, you know, workaday existence. Um, and it is, um, yeah, it inverts yet supports the official life. It's, um, it's dialogic. You go back and forth between these two phases of life without ever dialectically merging them together, okay? So they remain kind of dissociated from each other. So folly is normal during the Feast of Fools or during Carnival or during, um, you, know, uh, you know, the Day of the Dead or some of these other activities. It's normal. And then foolishness is stamped out of everyday life um, when you're doing the work of the medieval order. So, so you have these two dissociated phases of life. Foolishness, folly, carnival um, is associated with one uh, and not the other. And, and uh, yeah, so, so this is a quote from Bakhtin. The medieval man, sorry for the gender, um, lived as it were two lives. One official, monolithically serious and gloomy, subject to a strict hierarchical order, filled with fear, dogmatism, reverence, piety. And then a second life, the life of the carnival square, free, full of ambivalent laughter, blasphemy, the profanation of all that is holy, disparagement and obscenity, familiar contact with everyone and everything, 
and then both of these lives are legal and legitimate and are divided by strict temporal limits, right? So you're flipping back in these uh, dual phases, dialogic, right? There, there, there's two logics, two logics that are split off from each other, okay? So, um, you know, if you want to look at a few images of that, um, yeah, let's just sort, sort of do this. So uh, a really good book that visualizes this is uh, Michael Camille's uh, Image on the Edge, The Margins of Medieval Art. I think it's from the 1980s. Um, in this book, Camille looks at uh, primarily illustrated manuscripts of, of, um, you know, of, of the medieval era. Um, often, again, this is, the, um, this, is a, this is a book of ours. So this is essentially a, um, um, a religiously tinged you know, breviary, quite honestly. And so you have serious text and serious content, and then on the margins you get, you know, eroticized or sexualized or foolish content, all kinds of foolishness on the margins, right? So here's a, a butterfly and 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 uh, and and, uh, and so on in the margin here, right? And then there's other, you know, you just keep going, and it, again, like you'll have religious text, and here's, you know, someone w w with their their bun, their buttocks in an oven, sort of play on, on words with imagery there, um, and so on. So I, I know I have a whole bunch of images of that, but, you know, even in medieval uh, cathedrals, in the midst of the most sacred spaces, you would find in corners um, some of the most bizarre and even sexual um, carvings that, that were built into the, um, that were built into it. So I don't know, I, I had just a few more images of this, a real, again, serious religious content at the center, and then in the split off dialogic way, you know, there's no interrelation between what's going on in the main part of the text and what's going on in the margin, right? But here's where foolishness exists, and here's where workaday first life exists. Um, other images of it here, you have some monks down here sort of having a fight or something like that. They're not monks, just everyday people having a fight uh, while you have, again, something sacred going on. Um, you know, here's animals morphing into human beings and, and so on. Um, what else? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Some of these are kind of, they're not too repetitive yet, but here you go. Yeah, so here's an image of the... Um, I think it's the flight into Egypt or something like that, right? I think that's what that is. And uh, and here you have someone using, I think, a um, you know, a bellows, some sort of animal thing using a bellows. I got a monkey. You've got some um, naked people doing something uh, down there, right? Um, you know, <laughs> the everyday walks of life uh, taking place, right? So again, really serious content uh, intermixed with um, rather playful. Uh, material on the edge. So the point of this is that foolishness is intermixed with everyday life in the medieval and the Gothic world, right? It's there. This You wouldn't put someone who acted foolish into an asylum because you'd basically have to put the entire population into an asylum. So here's an image from Peter Bruegel, uh, The Feast of Fools. So yeah, this is a, a sort of a medieval um, carnival-esque event. Um, and, you know, again, you got you have an entire community here um, uh, putting on fool scap or, you know, the, the, the clothing of the fool and, uh, and acting foolishly, right? So, you know, Bruegel likes to always present these sort of frolicking images of peasants and so on. And, you know, again, they're, 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 they act in a madcap way. So this kind of dance is the same kind of dance that you see um, in peasant uh, villages in Bruegel's paintings. So again, serious life going on, as well as foolishness on the margin. I'll try to get rid of that. Um, yeah, here's some more images of, yeah, this is um, Daniel Hopfer. Yeah, so images of like a village fete or a village fair going on and, um, you know, frolicking and, and, and so on. You know, people acting foolish. So, yeah, here's a, uh, yeah, this is Peter... Uh, this is Rubens, um, and um, yeah, so again, uh, just to be a member of a medieval society required you to do a lot of serious hard work and to participate in serious, um, you know, straight activity, but then you also were in a kind of mandatory or legitimate way expected to participate in folly, 
frolicking, right? Like this. Okay. So that is what it was to be a medieval person, to live in a, in a serious first world and to have a second world of fun and frivolity and that kind of stuff intermixed um, along with it. Okay, so, um, yeah. So I think, I think this image then sort of sums up um, Foucault's movement out of the medieval world. This is the uh, sort of a famous, um, I don't know, I can't remember what this is called, like, 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 like uh, um, God, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like a very famous image of, of, of uh, the foolishness of time or that, you know, yeah. But it, but it sort of shows the entire world as being foolish. And this is from, you know, about 1550 or something like that. Again, my, my memory is bad. We'll blame COVID for it. Um, but this idea that the, that there are times when the entire world seems to be folly, right? So you have the globe, the world, um, in fool's cap, right? In, in, in the motley dress of, of a fool, of a motley fool. I have images here of our modern world where, uh, you know, mania is um, an early term for, um, you know, for, um, for mental, uh, for delirium and other forms of mental disorder. And we use that term now when we're referencing uh, stock speculation and financial speculation and bubbles and panics. And so here's a, a, an image from the 19th century of, uh, of financiers in the midst of, of uh, of madness, as it were. Okay. All right. So what? Fou so then, back to the conceptual map. So Foucault then argues that before that, then in the Middle Ages, right, the Gothic period, um, madness wasn't really a separate category, but foolishness was, and that um, and that the and, and, and that madness sort of intermixed with and intermingled with everyday life. It wasn't separated out. So I tried to sort of represent that here, right, in these two ways. So you either have these dialogic phase shifts, as Bakhtin would have it, or you just have the intermingling of the mad and the, the same without a separate category. Okay, then, uh, this, so chapter one then begins down here with, um, with the ship of fools. And so he writes about a Renaissance era movement to remove the mad from locations of um, really early modern capitalism. So really, uh, uh, the Ship of Fools was a sort of poetic um, uh, myth, I think, really more than anything, a kind of imaginary construct where people who didn't fit within the order, the, the, the order of reason or rationality or modern capitalism were placed upon these, um, these ships and then supposedly sent out uh, onto the sea. So they don't really exist. Uh, uh, Foucault's not really clear about that, but this isn't really a historical phenomena of any import, um, but, but it is a metaphor. So, so he writes about uh, um, cities encouraging um, mad people or fools to leave, right? To get out of town. So people who are exhibiting mental illness or people who wouldn't work, couldn't work, were encouraged to leave. So either to go on pilgrimages or again, the ship of fools to get them out of there, okay? All right, and so that goes on, and then he's arguing that um, that that about um, I don't know what the exact year is here, about somewhere in the 15th, 16th century forward, 16th century, 17th century into the early 18th century. Um, there's a period of what he calls the Great Confinement. This is a period when um, the early modern cities are cre are constructing general hospitals or hospital generals, poor houses, workhouses, jails, prisons, as places to confine those who threaten to disrupt uh, the social order. The primary people um, confined during the Great Confinement were the poor, the migrants, and the unemployed. But the, the, the mad, the mentally ill, were swept up with them. So, uh, so these were generalized, unclassified spaces of, you know, of, of a holding tank in the middle of, of early modern cities. And so, uh, so, again, this is the second great chapter of the book and, and um, very worth reading. Then he has chapters on, on the insane and how insanity begins to be defined uh, out of this. 
Um, and then and then theories of of you know passion and delusion, different forms of madness, aspects of madness, you know, physical manifestations, moral manifestations, and so on. And then he, then he begins to write about the treatment of of madness or mental illness, some of which is inside and some of which is outside of 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 these places of confinement. So outside of these hospitals, um, you had uh, you know the emergence of of kind of moral treatment, but that was often focused upon the body. We're consolidating spirits, supposedly engaging in acts of purification, bleeding, blistering, that kind of thing. Um, um, immersion or you know bath and water treatment showering that kind of stuff cold hot water that kind of stuff and then regulated movement uh travel uh, even music right and then inside the institutions you had the emergence of something like um, uh, a direct sort of challenge to unreason uh with counter reason and uh, so he writes there about um, awakenings, shocking people, not with electricity, but with other uh, acts really to shake, to, to awaken them, viewing delirium essentially as a waking dream. So you're trying to wake them out of a waking dream. Uh, theatrical representation, we'll talk about that in time. And then a return to the immediate or sort of a, a kind of mindful immersion in nature or in meditative work of various kinds, kind of the working cure, right? So I, again, a kind of interesting chapter there about the emergence of the treatment of the mental, mentally ill somewhere after the Reformation, after people have already been confined, where you start to try to do something with them. All right, then you get uh, these these other chapters that follow the Great Fear, where there begins to be a new sort of um, 18th century fear of mad people, um, and then a new what he calls a new division where uh, mentally ill people are begun to be, are classified out, separated out from those who are merely poor or uh, merely unemployed or criminal or, um, you know, uh, uh, the old and so on, right? So, so, so you wind up then in the modern period with modern institutions using modern therapeutic techniques that had their origins outside and inside of these other, uh, of the general confinement that they're taking place within an institution that um, that is reconstructed for the sole purpose of treating um, of the um, you know those who are mad or, or whose sanity is is in question. Okay, so that is in essence the skeleton key to the book. It, it it's the conceptual map of it. So he begins with leprosy, and lepr leprosy is what builds the initial houses of confinement. And even more importantly, builds the sort of psychological structure that um, of, of, of contamination and of moral panic, where there is someone in society that we have to exclude ritually in order for the rest of us to be safe. So this idea that um, you know that some, something like a political order or a moral order are created through exclusion, and um, and so that's the leper. And then the space of the leper eventually becomes the place where the mad and the unemployed and the poor and the migrant and the homeless and others are thrown in the great confinement. And then eventually you get the treatment of mental illness um, sort of devolving out of that. And then um, you get a separation or classification of institutions where prisons become spaces for criminals and um you know, uh, juvenile detention centers for youthful offenders, um, you know, uh, you know, poor houses for the poor, workhouses for the unemployed, and so on. And so you get the specialization that takes place, leaving behind then uh, the modern uh, asylum to treat the mentally ill. Okay, so that's sort of like the big story here. So why does this matter? Why would a sociologist uh, who, who, for whom time is short and for whom problems are big, want to read and focus upon this work. And to me, the key to the whole thing is what I have on screen right now. It is that moment of the great confinement. So this is the moment when there was this sweeping um, 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 uh, exclusion of, of, of unemployed and poor people uh, from uh, society 
And we need to talk about how this is linked to the emergence of early modern capitalism. Where did these people come from? Why were they there? And so on. Um, and, and then how, how, how does capitalism uh, drive people into cities and into uh, uh, you know, capitalist towns? And then how do these spaces of confinement, poorhouses, workhouses, prisons, asylums, right? How do these places uh, function as, as places of torture and terror to um, sort of imaginatively um, um, drive uh, the new arrivals into these towns into hard wage labor for very little money, right? So, so to me, the reason that this book matters so much is it's an account of the building of the institutions of confinement that are used to terrorize populations into conformity with an oppressive, even exploitative uh, external structure. That's why this book matters. And so, um, yeah. So if, if we can do this, maybe this will be the last sort of conceptual overview and then we'll begin to work through the book. Um, so about on page 37, uh, Foucault has a hint that, that I really want to draw attention to. He, he sort of makes an argument. He, he, he points to something like either Freudian uh, uh, psychoanalytic writing or Lacan's writing. He was familiar with Lacan later. I don't know if he was familiar with him at this point. But he sort of argues that, that, um, that or at least he's, there's an opening on page 37 where one can ask a direct question. What is madness exactly and what are spaces of confinement and and um and punishment and control and discipline and and um and judgment and treatment and so on what are these places like where do they exist so in lacan you know there's a distinction made between the symbolic structure of language and law the symbolic order this is concepts right the conceptual order of society that is distinguished from the world of fantasy or social imaginary. And that is distinguished from the real of sort of creaturely or embodied existence. So, um, so let's take something like the, um, the, um, the leper house, the Lazar house where lepers were stored. So we know that in the real, leprosy was a real thing. It really did infect bodies. Although oddly enough, it infected them through through um, through respiratory. Apparently, uh, it was a respiratory infection, not a skin infection. But um, but it, but it manifested itself in 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 uh, all kinds of skin, um, you know, very visible uh, um, and stigmatizing skin disorder. And um, so so that was a real thing. And so the bodies of the men and women and children who were placed within leper colonies or Lazar houses, this is a real phenomenon. The creaturely existence, the creaturely um, a world of, 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 of organic drives and so on, that this is this, in pulsations and all this kind of stuff. This is actually really happening. People are really winding up there, right? And so the question is, is in the great confinement, um, you know, Foucault writes that at one point, 1% 1 of the Parisian population was confined in, in something like poor houses, hospitals, prisons, right? About 1%. So what did the 99% who weren't confined think of, the, of that 1%? Well, that would be what the fantasy of the social imaginary was. What did they think? Uh, in, in other words, did they imagine that the people in that space were their own doubles, were, uh, were people who, who were like them, but for the grace of God go I, but for a single infection uh, go I, but for, um, um, you know, an economic downturn go I, those kinds of things, right? You know, where did, these, where, where did this exist in the social imaginary? We know that there were moral panics, and in many ways what Foucault argues is that the concept of sort of health or non-contaminated healthy living or something like that is constructed in the imaginary of the Middle Ages by placing the lepers out of sight in these houses of containment, right? And so, and so we convince ourselves or we create the category of healthy by making certain that the unhealthy uh, are visibly unhealthy are, are, are out of sight in the leper house, something like that. 
So in that sense, there's a moral panic. And so the lepers aren't viewed as people like the, you know, the average 99% of Parisians, but they're, but they're viewed as somebody, you know, fundamentally other or different. So in the early modern era, when poor people and unemployed people were being placed in these houses of confinement, did the 99% view those people as similar to them and but for the grace of God go I, or were they viewed as fundamentally other and distinct? And I think during the period of great confinement, there's no question about there's no question about this. Foucault is clear about it. Marx is crystal clear about it, that these spaces were used for torture and terror, right? The poor were being punished, not for committing a crime, but for being poor. The unemployed were being punished, not for committing a crime, but for not finding employment in the wage labor system, right? And people who had been forced off of their uh, villages and their uh, rural agrarian life and forced into towns were being punished simply for having something like that happen to them. So you're in the same position, basically, as migrants are. You know, so I'm, I'm, I'm recording this in November of 2021. There is a refugee crisis underway right now at the border between Belarus and Poland. Um, you know, those people that are trapped in this sort of no man's land in between these two nations, um, these ex it's, it's an exclusion zone that they're in right now, really a kind of rightless, stateless uh, space, truly their home of soccer in Agamben's terms. Um, what about the rest of the people who might migrate? Uh, what are they thinking of them? But for the grace of God, go I, if I dare migrate, will I wind up there? Or is there something fundamentally different about them? What Foucault would argue, what Marx would argue, what Agamben would argue, uh, what Hannah Arendt would argue, is that these are spaces of terror. And knowing that they exist, knowing that people can disappear inside of those spaces, and entire families can disappear inside of them, terrorizes um, wage laborers and poor people and homeless people into essentially doing anything to avoid it, right? To submitting to the most poorly paid and um, uh, work under the worst possible conditions, right? So it functions as terror. Okay, so um, so yeah, so what do the masses think of this? And then, and then you know, Foucault's writings about the symbolic structure. So, so um, what goes in the space, the label for these people inside? Um, so we know that, that the names can be, you know, leper, right? and poor and unemployed, right? And it can include, um, you know, the mad and the bad, the, the, you know, the criminal and so on. There's all these labels. But then how does this fit into a symbolic order of, of, uh, of honestly, of, of, of binary concepts and, and fundamental, um, you know, conceptual schemas? So the leper, by being excluded, creates non-leprosy or health. The poor, by being excluded, um, you know, create something like, uh, you know, working people or a working population, a proletariat. The unemployed, by being uh, excluded and controlled, creates, uh, again, a working proletariat. Um, putting the mad in there creates civilization or reason. Um, uh, you know, unreason being confined creates reason on the outside. And then, you know, putting the bad inside creates the legal order on the outside, right? By putting lawbreakers in, you create a legal order out. So that's the conceptual structure. So I think, I think you know, at all three levels, the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic, the real of, of embodied creaturely existence, the imaginary world of moral panic and, and uh, uh, fantasy and monsterization and so on, and then the symbolic order where we're creating the fundamental categories of language and law within, it, uh, within a society, that in all three of these things, the uh, processes of containment, of exclusion, of stigmatization, of marginalization, of normalization that Foucault is writing about are, are, are absolutely significant. And uh, again, that's part of the reason why I'm having uh, students read this book. Okay, so uh, having said that, I feel like taking a break. I think I'm going to take a break, and we'll start. We'll start with uh, uh, I'll walk through the book in the next uh, uh, section. We'll blame this short video on COVID.